talk is really intended to introduce uh, the public to the work that the Durham Black Burial Grounds Collaboratory has been doing since 2021, um, but also to provide some broader context on African American cemeteries nationwide and in Durham, especially. Um, I'd say that a word that comes to mind a lot when I'm in cemeteries is gathering. Um, so cemeteries are the final place where generations of Durham's African Americans gathered across multiple generations, um, pooling their resources so that they could be buried in dignity. And nowadays, the volunteer work days um, at places like Gear gather people from different ages, races, and social backgrounds. Um, and they also get excuse me, they also gather together the living and the dead, um, exposing our intertwined fates um, in really powerful ways. I think of just one example, um, being out at gear, participating in um, volunteer work days when outdoor activities were some of the only things you could do safely um, in, in the beginnings of the pandemic and the ways in which um, people around me started to connect that to the history of the 1918 influenza um, which certainly impacted uh, the number of burials at Gear. Um, but to get more, more to the point on the subject of the Durham Black Burial Grounds Collaboratory, I really consider this um, a unique gathering as well um, that has challenged each of us who are involved to work across the divides between our different disciplines and areas of research, also between different institutions in Durham that maybe don't collaborate as much as they should, um, and between academia and community activism. Um, so if you could advance the slide, Jenna. I'm going to um, just tell you a little bit about the collaboratory, um, and you can actually go to the next slide, please, Jenna. Thanks. So um, we're funded by a grant from the Duke Endowment, um, as I mentioned earlier, which put out a call in 2020 for projects on reckoning with race, racism, and the history of the American South. We're intentionally multidisciplinary and cross-institutional, as I just said, and our mission is to study Durham's African-American burial grounds, share their histories with the public, and reinvigorate them as spaces of dignity and learning. And I won't dwell on the um, bullet points below much because I, I think in our talk, we're gonna say a lot more about each of these, but broadly the ways we identified um, that we could pursue that mission are by contributing to the mapping and documentation in the cemeteries. Um, that's not something we'd ever parachute in and just do by ourselves um, in a space, but something that we do in partnership with community organizations that are already active and especially with um, descendants. We research the histories of these cemeteries and the lives of the people buried there and um, connect them to the context of Durham, race, and the American South. Um, we'll be showing you how we've involved students in hands-on archaeological and historical research in the cemeteries. And we're always talking to each other about um, not only what to do, but how to do it. So sharing teaching strategies, pedagogical innovations. Um, and we want to contribute more broadly to the dialogue about university community partnerships and best practices in these efforts in cemeteries. And we've actually had a lot of meetings and visits with um, people at universities around North Carolina and beyond who are, who are trying to do partnerships like this. Um, so next I'll introduce our speakers for today. Thanks, Jenna. And I just wanna start by saying that unfortunately, um, Alicia Jimenez, uh, who was going to be one of our speakers is ill today. Um, so she won't be speaking. I'm going to be trying to sort of share a little bit of the information uh, that was in that, that was in her talk. Um, but I'll go in the order of um, the intended order of when people were going to speak. Um, Khadija McNair, who you see on your screen, is the assistant site director at Stagville State Historic Site, where she interprets the histories of enslaved people and she aids the public in genealogy research. Khadija has a master's in public history from North Carolina Central University, where she wrote a thesis about the founding of Lincoln Hospital, Durham's first hospital serving African Americans. Um, she had previously worked as an interpreter at the Duke Homestead. Um, and she's gonna be talking about her research on two women buried at Gear Cemetery, Mary Sparkman and Caroline Barnes. Um, but in doing so, doing so, she's also gonna show how she contests dominant narratives of Durham's history 
and outlines an approach to reinserting the voices of the marginalized into public history. I would say Khadija's approach to that has really kind of set the tone um, and offered ethical guidelines for all of us as we do this work together. Um, Alicia Jimenez, who again, um, unfortunately can't join us today, is an assistant professor of classical studies uh, here at Duke. And her research engages with archaeological theory and the material traces of Roman imperialism between 2018 BCE and 100 CE. She runs an excavation project at the Roman army camps near Numantia, uh, which is now Reniebla, Spain. Um, and she's been visiting Durham cemeteries with students in her class, The Archaeology of Death, since 2015. Um, so she's uh, helped us prepare to, to share about some of the work that the Durham Black Burial Grounds Collaboratory does with students, particularly uh, the archaeology work. I am um, Associate Professor of the Practice in International Comparative Studies and Cultural Anthropology at Duke. Um, and my first book was Digging for the Disappeared, Forensic Science After Atrocity. Um, but more relevant today, um, I have a new book coming out in early 2024 called Sanitary Citizens, Reclaiming Buried Pasts to Revise the Present. The present. And that's um, about grassroots groups that are working to preserve and honor uh, places of the marginalized dead. Um, so in my talk, I'm going to focus on the forces that are threatening African American cemeteries nationwide and the social movements to reclaim them. Last but not least, Jenna Smith is a sophomore Robertson scholar in the International Comparative Studies major at Duke University. Um, she's our research assistant for the Durham Black Burial Grounds Collaboratory, but we very much also consider her um, a partner and collaborator. Um, she additionally works for the Wilson Center for Science and Justice at Duke Law School and is the head of the advocacy team for the Duke Justice Project, um, as well as a nationally ranked speaker in undergraduate moot corp. So you've got a lot going on, Jenna. <laughs> um, and she's going to be sharing her research on Black anonymity and weaponized silence, um, showing how our collective work with the Durham Black Burial Grounds Collaboratory can inspire a young researcher to push forward and take things in new directions um, that, you, that none of us would have, um, would have anticipated before we got to know Jenna. Um, so uh, I believe, oh yes, and so, and I wanted to be sure to mention Charles Johnson, who couldn't join us today, but is a co-founder of the Durham Black Burial Grounds Collaboratory. Um, Charles is an assistant professor of history at North Carolina Central, um, and he's, he directs the public history program there. Um, he is a major contributor to our work, although he won't be speaking today. And I believe with that, I can hand it over to Khadija to get us started. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I am Khadija McNair. Uh, I'm the assistant site manager at Historic Stagville. And as mentioned earlier, Stagville is a state historic site here in Durham, um, and it preserves a portion of one of the largest plantations in North Carolina. So the Benahan Cameron Plantation. Um, and at its height, it was over 30,000 acres large, and there were over um, 900 people enslaved there at one time, and of course, thousands of people have been enslaved there over the history of the site. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here are a few of the buildings that um, are still standing at Stagville. Um, the Benahan House, the white building on the right is the home of the first enslaving family. And um, the building pictured on the left is one of the dwellings for enslaved people that are still standing there as well. Um, so of course, my introduction to the burial grounds that um, we focus on in this collaboratory was through my work at Stagville. Um, we uh, do a lot of work around the Little River Cemetery, which is pretty close to where Stagville is off of Old Oxford Highway. Um, the Little River Cemetery was a cemetery for enslaved people um, originally, but of course it was used um, after emancipation. And then as people who were formerly enslaved move into Durham, um, those folks when they passed away would be, would be buried at Gear Cemetery. So 
um, as Stagville, we still do a lot of research around, of course, descendants and genealogy. And so we really connected to these burial sites. Um, and so as mentioned earlier, a large portion of uh, my work at Stagville is genealogy work. Um, and so that normally looks like uh, our staff connecting current descendants with the history of their ancestors who were enslaved um, throughout the Benahan Cameron plantations. Um, and at Stagville, we do have a very small staff. It's just three of us there full time. So a lot of that genealogy work has been extremely reactive, meaning that, you know, if a descendant comes in one day, um, we would do that research with them one on one. Um, and so the last few years, we've been uh, brainstorming ways to make that work less reactive. How can we kind of expand our genealogy work and not kind of focus on one individual at a time? Um, and so one project that came out of that was connecting the latest list of enslaved people from, you know, closest to emancipation as possible, you know, a list from the 1861 or 1862 or so on, connecting those list of families to the 1870 or 1880 census. And so we started doing that work um, and we were able to kind of flesh out a lot of um, individual families and, and build more narratives around those those folks post emancipation, um, we were also able to see kind of how a lot of these families impact Durham and the surrounding cities. Um, so next slide, please. Um, one family that I was able to do work on as a part of this project was the Sparkman family. So I discovered that Mary Sparkman um, was born into slavery at uh, on the Cameron Plantation. So pictured here is the 1862 inventory of enslaved people from the Jones Quarter of the Cameron Plantation. And that um, red line on the left kind of marks uh, Mary Sparkman and her family. Um, so she's listed there with her parents, Harry and Louisa. Um, she also has a daughter that was born that same year, which is kind of scribbled in pencil underneath her name. Her daughter's name was Susan. Um, and as well as her many siblings who are listed under her. So Mary would have been the oldest sibling as far as we can track. Um, so Mary Sparkman was likely in her early 20s when slavery ended. Um, she moved into Durham with her daughter, Susan, and her siblings and her parents, and they would all become successful landowners in the Hay Type community. Um, we know that Mary Sparkman would labor as a domestic servant for Benjamin Duke in his mansion in Durham. And when she dies in 1915, the Dukes pay for her headstone. She's buried in gear um, and her headstone solely memorializes her, so her servitude to the Duke family. Um, so next slide, please. So here is her, her uh, headstone that's still in, in gear today. Um, and so, of course, I was very aware of this headstone um, being a historian here in Durham, but I had never been able to make the connection between the Sparkman family and Stagville. And so another person that I was able to do a lot of research on was um, Caroline Barnes, and she's also buried in gear. Um, next slide, please. Caroline was uh, born enslaved in Hillsboro around the 1840s. Um, and at 11 years old, she was sold to Washington Duke. Um, and so this is a record of Caroline being sold to Washington in 1855. Um, she was sold away from her mother and her two sisters. So um, above Caroline's name, you can see Gracie and Emmeline. Gracie would be her mother. Um, and Emmeline, a younger sister, and, and Eliza under Caroline's name was another sister of hers. Um, and so she's sold by herself to Washington Duke. And she would uh, be sold to the Duke family at a time when the Dukes were small tobacco farmers, middle-class tobacco farmers. Um, and she likely came to their farm and assisted in cleaning and cooking and caring for small children or children about the same age as she was. Um, we know that after emancipation, Caroline would continue laboring for the Duke family as a, as a domestic servant. So she um, would move into mansions with them and into uh, downtown Durham. 
and she spent the next 54 years of her life serving the Duke family. Um, when Washington Duke died, he did leave land and stake in their tobacco company to Caroline Barnes. Um, but of course, as a historian and, and doing this research, I understand that no amount of money could repay Caroline for her lifetime of labor to this family. Um, and that, that money also did not repair the damage of separating her from her mother and her sisters at such a young age. Um, we also know that another way that Washington Duke tried to honor Caroline's um, labor was to erect a monument to slavery on Trinity College's campus, so what would become Duke University. Um, yes, you can go to the next slide, Jenna. Thank you. Um, but we know that when Washington Duke thinks up this idea to uh, create this monument to slavery honoring Caroline on the campus, um, Caroline Barnes, along with many other uh, Black Durham residents, uh, would come together and convince him not to do that. So I do have to mention that the folks who are part of this network of people to um, convince Washington Duke to put money into a hospital were um, Dr. Aaron Moore, John Merrick, Dr. Stanford Warren, um, Addie Evans, who was another cook for the Duke family, and also a man named Albert Armstrong. And through my research, I was able to discover that Albert Armstrong was Mary Sparkman's son-in-law. He would marry Mary Sparkman's daughter, Susan, who was born in slavery at Stagville as well. Um, and so these folks come together and tell Washington Duke, hey, we don't want a monument. Um, we would rather have this money put into a hospital for Black folks in, in Durham. And so that would become Lincoln Hospital. It was established in 1901. Um, and although the monument was never built, the cornerstone of the hospital would still have the, the idea, the inscription that would have gone on the um, monument. So it would say, um, with the grateful appreciation and loving remembrance of the fidelity and faithfulness of the Negro slaves to the mothers and daughters of the Confederacy during the Civil War. Um, so we know that this hospital uh, symbolized progression for the Black community, but it was always kind of stained and adorned with this ideology of racism um, that, that would go on to it um, until it was torn down, of course, and another Lincoln Hospital was built a little later on. Um, and so through doing this research for um, of Mary Sparkman and Caroline Barnes, um, I hope to kind of disrupt the prevailing narratives about Durham's history that center kind of uh, wealthy white men. Um, we know that they did not do all the work by themselves and they definitely um, don't deserve all the praise. Um, and so I hope that we can kind of Center Mary Sparkman and Caroline Barnes and the many other folks that we aren't able to name um, yet uh, who, who were um, very imperative in, in creating the city we live in today. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk through to the best of my ability um, some of what uh, Alicia Jimenez was going to share. Um, I definitely lack uh, many of her forms of technical knowledge and expertise, but I think that a lot of what um, Alicia wanted to communicate and we wanted to communicate as a group is the ways in which um, as we work with students, a number of us work with students at Gear and other cemeteries, we're trying to thoughtfully and strategically build um, from one group of students to the next. Um, so this is both collaborative across different classes and institutions, but also um, sort of uh, an iterative process. And you can advance the slide, Jenna. Um, so we, first of all, always take the time to provide context in the cemeteries where we go with students. This is just one of many groups of students that we've um, taken on narrative tours through the cemetery. Slide. Thanks. Um, and whenever possible, we have the students meet descendants. Uh, this is Michael Williams, who's um, a board member of the Friends of Gear. 
and a descendant uh, with ancestors buried at Gear. And he's, uh, you know, here he's talking with students in Alethea's fall 2021 class slide. We estimate that over the past few years, we've taken about 79 students um, to Gear Cemetery, both to uh, experience the site and get these tours, but also to do hands-on work slide. Um, and a lot of that work started, at least the archeological side of the work really started with Andrew Tharler, who's no longer at Duke, but was a lecturing fellow in the writing program here. He taught a class called the Archaeology of Durham in 2021 and had his students spend a lot of time at Gear Cemetery um, using their cell phones to actually uh, pinpoint the GPS locations of as many visible markers as they could find. Um, and this enabled the students to gain a better understanding of the cemetery as a whole, especially when, um, when Andrew helped them plot these on a map, as you can see in ArcGIS. Um, but the cell phone technology, you know, doesn't pinpoint the uh, locations as accurately as you might. Um, so slide. So um, in a follow up, Ed Triplett from the uh, Wired Lab and the Art and Art History Department worked with Alethea and both graduate and undergraduate students to take surveying equipment out um, and sort of enrich that data with more precise uh, locations of all the visible markers. Um, and you can advance the slide. Uh, they then followed up to try to make sure that all of the inscriptions that, that we could possibly read were recorded um, using flashlights. So that's what you see here, slide. Um, and then Ed taught a number of students to do this 3D photogrammetry of the visible markers. Um, so actually, if you advance the slide, Thanks. You can see how these rich images that were taken around the entire marker were then turned into 3D models um, that you can that you can sort of see on your computer screen and even move around and see from multiple angles. Um, there are a lot of implications to making that record. One is that um, the cemetery is still uh, Gear Cemetery and many other um, cemeteries like it are still subject to damage. Um, that includes damage from a neighbor who just a few years back cut had a tree cut down in his yard and had it just fall right into the cemetery and cover up and crack a number of markers. But also because some of the trees are older and rotting and things like that, we get branches that fall down, things that happen. Um, without any direct human action. Um, and of course, uh, many of the descendants uh, who have people buried in a place like Gear um, have dispersed over time to many other locations, maybe aging, may not be able to visit the cemetery. So as we're able to share these, uh, re these really rich models of the headstones, we can, we can share them with people who can't actually visit the site. Um, slide. So another thing that I know Alethea wanted to talk about is that um, to the naked eye and even when the students were marking the location of grave markers, um, it can seem like uh, one of the differences between the historic white cemeteries, for example, Maplewood, which is like the crown jewel kind of cemetery of Durham right near Duke's West Campus, then one of the differences that students notice between that and a place like Gear is that everything at Maplewood looks sort of neatly laid out and ordered in this kind of grid, whereas the experience of walking around Gear Cemetery and other historic African American cemeteries is often this kind of nonlinear, um, mixed up uh, ordering to it, which can perpetuate this notion that somehow that's a less planned and chaotic space. Um, but if, if slide, Jenna. Thanks. Um, so drawing on the work that um, our friends at the East End Cemetery Collaboratory have done in Richmond um, in, a, in a really important historic African American cemetery there, we know that when you get beyond the visible, um, you and you start 
using LIDAR and other technologies to be able to see where all the depressions of graves are and all the possible locations of graves, what you uncover is often cemeteries that are much more dense than their white counterparts because um, there was so little access to land and access to space, but that were nevertheless very carefully planned um, and had a layout and things like that. Um, so one of the things that these technologies do is not just document the cemetery, but in, in the same spirit um, as Khadija was talking about her genealogy and historical work, they disrupt um, narratives, false narratives of, of, in this case, sort of there being less intention or um, less thought put, in, put into African American burial grounds. Um, slide. Uh, in, in parallel with all the archaeological work the students have been doing at GEAR, um, I've been working a long time to do much more sort of historical, interpretive, social science type of work um, with, with either classes that I've taught or um, classes that I've, that I've co-taught with others. Um, so in summer, oh sorry, in spring 2020, the first iteration of my class, Death, Burial, and Justice in the Americas, spend a semester researching the lives of individual people who were buried at GEAR in partnership with the Friends of GEAR. And then actually just as the pandemic lockdowns has started, we were able to share those histories online in a really well attended event called Histories of Dignity. Um, after that, we were able to participate in a summer program at Duke called Story Plus that uh, funds students to live here and work in the digital humanities um, in sort of mixed teams of faculty, grad students, and undergraduates. So we did this program called Labor, Dignity, and Practices of Freedom. And that's something I co-taught with Nick Levy and Carissa Trotta from the Friends of Gear Cemetery. We also had facilitation by a graduate student in the public history program at NCCU, Oralonisha Yarborough. And you can see three, the three titles of the projects that students, uh, Nairobi Manuel, Wei Yin Zhao and Kerry Rourke did that summer. And I would be happy in the chat once I'm not speaking to share links to those really fascinating um, research projects. Last but not least, I'm, I'm teaching that class again, the Death, Burial and Justice class. And our project for this semester is to um, take the in plain sight exhibit that was mounted at Gear Cemetery in 2021 and remount it with new content and new interpretation at Duke. Um, so for anybody who's interested, um, that will be up from late April through June. And I'm happy to, if folks email me or whatever, I'm happy to share the more detailed information. Slide. Um, oh yes, and so now I transition into my prepared portion of the talk. Um, you could advance the slide, Jenna. Um, so since about 2017, I've been studying the work of organizations around the country that are reclaiming burial grounds of the marginalized dead. And that's allowed me to become involved with hands-on work and advocacy efforts, as well as obviously the Durham Black Burial Grounds Collaboratory. Um, so the groups I've worked with include organizations that are working in African-American cemeteries, including the Friends of Gear Cemetery here in Durham, the Friends of East End, End Cemetery uh, in Richmond, which is a cemetery that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I believe I saw that Yamona Pierce from the Hamilton Hood Foundation, who's been working in Pierce Chapel Cemetery in Georgia, is also uh, at, this, at this talk today. So that's another person I've had the privilege to work with. Um, slide, please. That said, my research includes not only African American cemeteries, but also psychiatric hospital cemeteries and other cemeteries associated with disability related institutions around the country. And these are spaces where people were often buried under numbers, sort of anonymized and not um, without their names visible, kind of dehumanized. Um, and I've also been researching and working in Mount Moriah, which is a massive abandoned cemetery in Southwest Philadelphia that has um, a lot of different people connected to it over the years, but um, for a number of decades was a really crucial burying ground for the Black Muslim population of Philadelphia. Um, so all of these are 
places where there are grassroots efforts to reclaim the space and honor the dead, um, including through the ongoing research that we're talking about today. And you can advance, Jenna. So we've shared already um, some of the work that the Durham Black Burial Grounds Collaboratory is doing to document and restore cemeteries. Um, but I think we should maybe rewind a little bit and ask how the cemeteries got like this. Why is there, as Zach Mortis says, a crisis of African-American cemeteries in the United States? Um, to focus a little bit on the example of Gear Cemetery here in Durham, the cemetery was founded by four African-American men in 1877 and maintained by generations of people who were essentially double paying for burial because Maplewood, which we mentioned earlier, was supported by tax dollars, um, so including taxes that the African-American population was paying, but people couldn't be there. It couldn't be buried there. Um, it was, you know, segregated. So, um, so Black Durhamites had to sort of both have their wealth extracted from Maplewood and find their own separate burial ground. Most African American cemeteries around the US are on land that it was considered less desirable, that's been harder to maintain um, than their white counterparts, white cemetery counterparts. Um, and many African American burial grounds, such as Violet Park here in Durham, have already been paved over and lost. In 1926, um, at Gear Cemeteries, uh, sorry, as Gear Cemeteries, roughly two acres were starting to fill up and get crowded with the dead. Black Durhamites petitioned for the city to purchase more land just to the east of the cemetery, um, and the white neighbors mobilized against it um, and, and won. So that land is now occupied by this unsightly parking lot um, for telephone company trucks that you can see in the photo on the right behind the, the headstone. Um, and those, you know, those trucks, that parking lot, that's just a permanent feature of what things look like from the cemetery. So I think when we talk about, about things like vandalism, we need to be thinking not only about the dumping of trash, which certainly happens, about people toppling headstones, graffiti, those things certainly happen in African-American burial grounds, but also beyond the immediate space of the cemetery, what borders it? Um, has a noisy road been sort of placed right along the cemetery because people didn't have political capital, didn't have voice? Um, you know, is the cemetery next to a dump like East End in Richmond is? I think we have to rethink what we call vandalism. And just like uh, people have um, incorporated a notion of structural violence into their notion of violence, you know, violence that works through complex systems, we also need to be thinking about systemic vandalism in these spaces. Um, and then even over the decades, as there have been efforts at historic preservation in many of the cities I've been studying, Black people and the places that have mattered to them are often underrepresented and undervalued. Um, but amidst all of those challenges and disruptions, it's important to say that many families kept caring for their ancestors' graves. Slide. And that's important because, um, in part because there's this narrative of abandonment or neglect that's often featured in, in coverage of African American cemeteries that seems to almost like turn the um, kind of invert things and turn the responsibility back on the communities that have cared about these spaces the most. Um, a descendant who's active in cemetery restoration in Richmond told me, um, I really resent the narrative of these abandoned cemeteries because the families have always been involved. In this descendant's case, even when she lived far away from Richmond for many years, she would come down on special trips to clear her family's grave. Um, or she would hire somebody else to come do it. When I was at her house, she showed me a video on her phone of a multi-generational group of her family members gathered around their ancestors' graves, um, singing a spiritual together. Slide. So that descendant I've just mentioned helps remind us of the importance of attending not only to degradation and damage in these spaces, but also love, organization, and resistance. Many African-American cemeteries still bear the emblems of civic associations that were created partly in order to pool capital and bury people in dignity. As the poet Kiki Petrosino writes, these graves preserve a still shimmering network of black intentionality and mutual care. 
On a more intimate level, uh, when you're on work days in the cemetery, you often can uncover plates, vases, and other grave goods that have been left by loved ones at headstones. Those form their own archive of care, as do the headstones. So in the middle of the slide, you can see the headstone at gear of Annis Glenn, who was born over 200 years ago. And her headstone, I don't think you can make it out, but her headstone reads, her life was beauty, truth, goodness, and love. On the left is a handmade sign that somebody left outside of Little River Cemetery near Stagville that just says, remember. Um, and we don't know who carved that, but it had been, it had been placed on the tree there. Um, and then all the way on the right is a sign that um, Kelly Bryant, a Durham legend and public historian who was one of the first people to draw attention and concern to gear where he had some ancestors of his own buried. Um, this is a sign that he placed there when there was not yet anything else marking the, the cemetery and when it was so overgrown that most people passing by would have only seen a patch of woods. Um, okay, slide. Um, because African American cemeteries are sites of so many layers of injustice and damage, but also so many forms of beauty and meaning, the organizations working to reclaim them face a lot of complex challenges. One is a tension between restoration uh, or reclamation and revision. So on the one hand, there's this understandable impulse to try to return these spaces to some originary state, to go back to the way that they were planned and experienced by the people who first buried their dead there. Um, but often, as Khadija made clear, there's um, gaps in the documentation, gaps in our knowledge. Um, and so we don't know exactly what the cemetery looked like, or there's no way to do that without it being destructive. So for example, we know that most of the trees currently at Gear were not there when it was created on farmland in the late 1800s. But does that mean that all of the trees there now, which provide shelter and beauty, should be cut down? Um, a complicating factor is that the roots of those trees have been entangled for a long time now with the remains of the dead. So on a recent visit with my students to Gear, Carissa Trotta, the volunteer coordinator for Friends of Gear Cemetery, um, put it this way, the trees are the ancestors now, we have to protect them. Um, so many of the activists that I've interviewed and worked alongside are trying to balance this impulse to restore um, with a new kind of a new project of inserting these cemeteries into the memory landscape of their cities in a new and reinvigorated way. Um, there's an early uh, curriculum that was developed around Gear Cemetery called Reclaiming Yesterday. It was created in the early 90s. And in the discussion questions for students, it asks this really poignant question. It says, why isn't Gear a Durham landmark? Um, but the folks doing this work in cemeteries are also reaching back in American history to an earlier model of cemeteries as vibrant public spaces, to go back to a term I used earlier, as spaces where people really gather um, and learn and live together. So that said, there are some best practices and standards for what a cemetery should ultimately look like as it goes through revision processes. And the most important one, the kind of gold standard, is to have descendant input. But to have, um, but to determine who is a descendant of people buried at a marginalized African American cemetery, Researchers have to piece together stories from archives that, like the ones Khadija works with, are sometimes non-existent, sometimes fragmentary, and often dehumanizing. As Michael Blakey, the anthropologist who will be visiting Duke next week, and others have argued, the descendant community around an African-American cemetery, the people who feel the strongest stake in its fate, can extend far beyond biological kin. Um, the president of the Friends of Gear Cemetery, Deborah Taylor Gonzalez Garcia didn't grow up in North Carolina herself. But when I sat down and interviewed her, she drew really interesting parallels between the life of an educator who's buried at Gear, P.W. Dawkins, and her own great grandfather. Slide. What she said to me was, They're not my people, but they are my stories, referring to the dead people buried at Gear. And that phrase has really stuck with me as a very vivid way of redefining the descendant community. 
around these cemeteries. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't ongoing dilemmas, not only about how to locate descendants, but how to ensure that their input is represented without overburdening them. Um, how much and what kind of descendant input is enough to move forward in making consequential changes to what a cemetery looks like. Um, and there are also layers of danger um, in terms of organizations or individuals coming in and doing a very thin or kind of instrumental version of community engagement. Um, that's really more about trying to co-opt uh, the claim that descendants are involved or that descendants have had input. Um, and that in turn can either build on divisions that already exist, exist within descendant communities or actually create new ones. Slide. So those are obviously really complex uh, questions and I don't think we'll answer any of them together today here. But to me, they all point to the need for more dialogue between these grassroots activists. And um, that's something that we feel cemetery university partnerships can facilitate, can be part of. Um, we can enrich the work through the multiple disciplines that Khadija, Alifia, Jenna, and Charles and I bring to the table. Um, and we've already been successful and will continue to work at mobilizing university resources to create um, space, a space to meet. Um, and you can think of that metaphorically, but sometimes quite literally, it's about like booking a room um, for everybody to get together and, and have a conversation. Slide. So I'll end my remarks just with a bit of realism about the time frame under which this work takes place. The Durham Black Burial Grounds has been a collaboratory has been around for two years, but we're joining descendants and activists who've been caring for these sites for much longer. And this work to be done well has to unfold slowly. Um, so I'll use the words of my friend Brian Palmer, a co-founder of the Friends of East End slide. He says, when I go out to the cemetery now, even with all that summer growth, which is, you know, getting a little out of control, I can still feel that power that, yes, all of these records, all of these plots, all of these stones are still here. And if we can't clear them today, we'll do it tomorrow or next week or next month. We'll be back to that clearing. And I will pass it over to Jenna now. That was so incredibly said. Those words are going to sit with me. Um, for the next section of this presentation, I'll, I'll stop sharing and hand it over to Khadija. All right, thank you so much. So hi everybody, my name is Jenna. I'm a student here at Duke and I'm going to be talking to you about an independent study project that I conducted entitled Caring for Impossible Legacies, a Meditation on Black Anonymity. But before we get into the contents of my project, I just wanted to provide some context for the ways in which the Durham Black Burial Grounds Collaboratory influenced the work that I did over the course of the semester. So you can go to the next slide. Um, some of the principles that were extremely influential in the work that I engaged in are listed on the slide right here. So that's consciously spending time in physical spaces that have been overlooked and that are spaces of remembrance, reckoning with how to advocate for individuals who can no longer speak for themselves, learning how to tell the story of another, and working with the living to determine how best to advocate for the dead. So all of these influential factors were sitting with me as I began my project. So if we go to the next slide, you will see a very famous painting from the year 1800 entitled, in the translation is Portrait of a Negress. And I usually use this painting to frame the conversation surrounding my research because this painting was a world renowned work that currently holds the honor of hanging in the loop. It's, but it hasn't always been so widely revered. When the artist Benoit originally unveiled this painting at the French Salon, it was looked down upon by many critics as a black stain on the walls. 
So the criticisms primarily stemmed from this extremely racist sentiment, upset that a black woman was featured in the painting as its sole subject, as opposed to the traditional characterization of a background actor in a white world. And forgive me for my hand gestures, I get excited when talking about this stuff. So despite the initial reception, over time, it has become interpreted as one of the most well-known paintings from the turn of the 19th century. But despite this evolution, little to no information was published about the portrait subject. So while it was common for portrait models to have their identities protected for their privacy during this time period, it is extremely remarkable that such an influential painting would have little to no documentation ab explaining the individual's identity. So while it was widely assumed that this was a formerly enslaved woman from Guadalupe, for centuries, little else was known or even investigated about her story. So this presents us with this kind of tension. On the one hand, the sitter may have been empowered as the sole subject of this boldly political painting. But on the other hand, she is in a way still rendered, rendered silent. So this presents us with a host of questions. Does the exclusion of the sitter's identity deny her of her agency? What action is most appropriate when honoring the sitter and paying homage to her legacy? Are we as the viewers entitled to knowing her name? And how does it benefit the sitter for us to know her name and identity? So if we move to the next slide, you'll see a quote that to give credit where credit is due, many incredible thinkers have mulled over very similar questions in the past. And in reference to a similar type of quandary, scholar Saidia Hartman once wrote, a name is a luxury that she isn't afforded. Other sitters are unnamed, but they can be identified. She is the only one who is anonymous. The only thing I knew for sure was that she did have a name and a life that exceeded the frame in which she was captured. So the work of Hartman was extremely influential in approaching this work. Another intellectual predecessor would be uh, Truyo and his work, Silencing the Past, Power in the Production of History. So as you can see from this quote and the title of that book this, and the through line of these names is that I grappled with the work of individuals who were focused on what it meant to create a history and how that, individ in, how that impacted individuals. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see the central questions that these boil down to. Those central questions were, what does it mean to be rendered silent? And how do we respond to the systemic silencing of black communities, particularly those of black women? So when attempting to answer these questions for the study, I became heavily immersed in this internal debate about rhetoric. I got tangled in the weeds of what specific terms we should use to describe the oppression that individuals face such as black anonymity, rather than attempting to grapple with these questions head on. But that internal battle did teach me a new lesson when working on this project. And that is just don't discount the things that you already know. There was an internal knowledge, perception, and expertise that I brought to the subject matter. And I needed to trust that internal knowledge more than I was initially willing to. So this isn't just a lesson that I learned from working with these things in the abstract but from specifically speaking to the incredible researchers that I had the opportunity to sit down with. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see um, black, or sorry, could you go to the one after that? Yes, perfect. So in order to answer some of the questions that I mentioned earlier, I needed to develop a system on how to build upon previous knowledges and harness the voices of those who have already been thinking about these questions. So in order to do this, I didn't only just read and sit with works of Black feminist theory and Black scholarship, but the critical component of the research was sitting down with Black women who researched Black women. Because I felt that their expertise and voices were critical to an exploration of how to preserve these stories, as they were both the impacted and the impactors. I also chose this approach of study because, admittedly, I was a little frustrated. I decided that the concept of Black anonymity couldn't remain cloistered within academia, tucked away between decades of papers interrogating the nature of Black silence. Instead, I wanted this concept, in order to truly prove its worth, to be evaluated in the context of the real world and questioned and addressed by living, breathing researchers who work each day to rectify historical silences. So if we go to the next slide, that methodology involves speaking with three 
incredible interviewees. So the first was Professor Jasmine Cobb. Jasmine Cobb is a professor of African and African American studies and of art, art history and visual studies at Duke University. And she writes on representations of black freedom with a focus on black women. You also had the pleasure of meeting Khadijah McNair, who I also sat down with. And the last person I met with was Chris Mayfield, who was a descendant of one of, one of Durham, North Carolina's historically black cemeteries, Gear Cemetery. And she also conducts research as a genealogist centered around her family, the, Hills, the Hillsborough-based Wooded family. So if we go to the next slide, in my research surrounding Black anonymity, I often operated in the space of Black, looking at the different manners in which individuals have been historically silenced in art history, the archives, and the everyday lives of the individuals that I interviewed. However, for today's conversation, in keeping with the work of all the organizations and um, efforts that were just mentioned earlier in the presentation, I want to look forward at how we can do better. So some of the main takeaways that I had from these conversation was one, we must bring our full personhood and identity into the room with us. That's something that I took away from each speaker. That's because when I sat down with them, one of the first questions I asked them was very simply, why do you research Black women? And most of them responded, well, I am a Black woman. And this might seem like a rote response on a surface level, but in reality, it says something deeply profound regarding how their personhood and identity shouldn't be separated from their work. This brings us to a quote from the uh, seminal Black woman's text, all the women are white, all the Blacks are men, and some of us are brave, which states that coldly objective scholarship that changes nothing is not what we strive for. Objectivity is itself an example of the reification of white male thought. What could be less objective than the totally white male studies, which are still considered knowledge? Everything that human beings participate in is ultimately subjective and biased, and there's nothing inherently wrong with that. The bias of Black women's studies must consider as, a prime, as the primary knowledge that will save Black women's lives. Now, as I come up on time, the two final conclusions that I want to discuss today were anonymity is not exclusive to though that history has, quote, forgotten. Now, to explain that, I want to take the example of Harriet Tubman, whose story has been widely told time and time again. In the case of Tubman, regardless of how many $20 bills or children's books covers that she may occupy, there is still extremely fundamental information that we do not have and likely will never have about Tubman's life that we would have access to if she were white. For instance, her birth date is unknown and is only rough, roughly approximated to 1825. And the final component that I want to address with the conclusions is who tells the stories matter and who we center in the work matters. It's important to acknowledge that Black anonymity extends beyond simply not having information about an individual. It can also be apparent in the source of one's information. So Professor Cobb articulated in our conversation, I don't have a source where Tubman writes in her own words, in her own hand, what she thinks. Instead, she tells her story to a white woman who then creates a book. In fact, most of the information that the, that the public currently possesses about Tubman's life was gathered through this book written by a white woman. So the fact that the systems of slavery that denied Tubman an education and then subsequently impeded her ability to relay her own story, thus also prevent a present a form of anonymity. So the final slide I have here just circles back to this painting that we opened with, Portrait of Negress. And I wanted to close with this painting because it reminds us of these stories aren't lost to history, even if we feel that they might be. We have to keep pushing. And what exemplifies this is while this painting was referred to as Portrait of a Negress for over 200 years, in the year 2019, when resources were reinvested into uncovering her name, it was discovered that Portrait of a Negress was rather Portrait of Madeline. So these stories aren't lost. We just have to keep looking for that. 